Copyzilla time. Copyzilla time. So as most of you guys know, um, there's been a lot of drama around the cast media situation. Um, all these podcasters coming out and essentially explaining um, the bad deals that they got put into and the fact that this cast media guy called... Um, whatever his name is, um, has been scamming them, not giving them their monies. And it's essentially opened up a whole Pandora's box around the podcasting advertising model and how really scammy it is. It's almost similar to like a Ponzi scheme, it kind of feels like, right? Pyramid scheme, whatever. But it sounds like a big scam. If you have watched it, I please forgive me if I pause it a lot. I know some of you guys don't like when I pause too much, but, you know, it's a stream, so I kind of have to do that. So if you want to watch it yourself, then I implore you to do so. The guy's channel, if you don't know what it is, is Coffeezilla. He's really good. So check him out. He's got some really good exposés on, you know, standard scams online and shit, NFTs, the Logan Paul stuff. So check out his channel if you want to see it yourself. But I'll be pausing here and there and breaking down and giving my opinions as we go on. So without further ado, let's go. $4 million was stolen from these podcasters and I decided to investigate. I found the man responsible, but before we confront him, let's go back to where it all started when Theo Vaughn, a comedian, released this. Our podcast was defrauded. We were stolen from uh, the company that did it is Cast Media and the man that did it is Colin Thompson. In, in total, I've just between talking with folks, there's up to $4 million that I know of. Uh, we're in the six figures. I know of podcasts that are in the seven figures. Now, when I saw this, I had the same two questions on my mind as you do. One, who is Colin Thompson? And two, y'all are making six to seven figures doing podcasts? Exactly. I'm in the wrong line of work. Exactly. I make like four figures here in the $10 million studio. Barely keep the lights on, okay? So I went to do some research, figure out, you know, how these people are making all this money and also how they got robbed. And what I found out was that this company that stole the $4 million was a podcast network called Cast Media. Podcast network being a fancy name for saying they represent podcasts to find sponsors. You know, all that stuff you violently skip with the fast forward 15 second button. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those guys. And Cast Media would basically work with them as a middleman. They would take some money, give the podcasters the read, and then give the money. Of course, taking a cut for themselves. Now, that is simplifying it a bit, and we'll go into the details more later. But what you need to know is that Cast Media hadn't been paying their talent on time. And what started as being late for maybe a month had turned into seven, eight, nine months late on paying until one day Cast Media and their CEO, Colin Thompson, says, hey, we're probably going to go into bankruptcy, which means you get nothing hmm. unless you take a special deal with another podcast network called Podcast One. Now, who's Podcast One? Well, it's an even bigger network, and they basically say, hey, we'll acquire you, pay off what you're owed, if you sign a new deal with new terms with us. If you do, you'll get back some of the money you're owed now, some of the money you're owed over two years, and you'll also get stock in our... Ah, oh, okay. <clears throat> so they're going to get <clears throat> 33% of cash you're owed up front. Again... Just look at it from the perspective of what you see Brendan doing, because he's most he's one of the most easy people to read. So he definitely took the podcast one deal because the moment that all stuff happened, because you remember before watching the TFAK clips on the Fire and the Kids subreddit, there was clips of Brendan like saying under his breath, he's struggling for money, blah, blah, complaining, complaining, right? But then he stopped doing those kind of jokes about being broke, not having money. Then all of a sudden, he appears with this new truck. <laughs> right? So... And if you remember before that, he cancelled the European gig because, you know, he probably thought, you know what, I'm not going to sell tickets. It's probably going to cost me more money to go across the pond. I'm going to scrap it. He cancels the tour. Um, he kind of fires a bunch of people. Um, and then it goes quiet on stuff. And then out of the blue, he's suddenly buying a truck. So clearly he got this. He, he took the podcast one though because that 33% of the cash owed up front, he took that money. And of course, like the, bit, like the beast of a businessman he is, he put that immediately into a new truck. They're going to get another 33% over two years, you know. Imagine splitting a 33% money that you're owed over two years. That is insane to think that far ahead for money you should have now. And then the rest of it in stock options, which will unlock in two years. So you're basically locked in with them for two years plus whatever your contract length is. Fucking hell. Our company. But what stock? Well, Podcast Network Stock, a company that wasn't public yet, but as of this video, now is and is down oh. almost 50%. Now, if you took that stock in two years, you could sell it 
how much it's worth at that point is dubious. Now, Podcast One would say they were just trying to help. It wasn't their debt, so it's a great deal. Now, the more cynical view of this is that it's kind of strong-arming creators. You either take the deal or you'll never get what you're paid. Exactly. I mean, podcasters like Jim Cornette were literally told, in the event that Cast is unable to close the Podcast One asset sale, it will likely declare bankruptcy. So take the deal or lose everything you're owed. And to make things stranger, Podcast One was paying Cast Media in stock for every podcaster that took the deal. So if you agreed and wanted the money you were owed, you're kind of bailing out the company mm -hmm. that got you into this mess. So obviously some people didn't like that deal. Although understandably, others did and took the deal. And look, I'm not here to litigate whether those podcast one deals are good or bad. Frankly, it's not the point of this video. All I think it is bad because if anything, the only people who should be taking that podcast one deal are the ones who are like, what you'd say working class content creators like if you honestly like you know you don't have any affiliation with any some sort of big person you're not like a you know you don't have a celebrity around you just kind of do the podcast as like a you know as a creative endeavor but it's also kind of your job you don't have anything else going for you then i think that other somebody offering you 33 percent of the money owed and you don't have any money i understand the desperation but i think when you're brian and brendan and stuff it's more so just because you don't understand business you don't want to do the you don't want to you don't want to do the work of maybe researching and finding out who else you can go to to get a new deal um, you don't want to do the business on your own and you just want the money guaranteed up front quickly now there's no other thought behind it do you know what I mean it makes you look worse I think other people could explain it better when they really hey look I'm, I'm behind on my rent I can't you know I can't put food on the table bloody blah, blah blah but Brendan and Brian are in that position they were just lazy they just didn't want to do the work of having to find out what other podcast networks work for them, working out a plan of how to do it on their own. You know, that's the thing that makes them look worse in this position, in my personal opinion. All cleanups are going to be messy. What I did want to know, though, is how did that $4 million go missing in the first place? And to try to find out, missing. Hilarious. I began to reach out to everyone, starting with Colin Thompson, to ask for his side of the story. You're being accused of basically stealing $4 million. Your clients say you defrauded them. What's your side of the story? Yeah, I appreciate you reaching out. You know, um, I wanted to talk with you because I he looks better in the video than he does in his picture. Isn't it? That picture that he's got of himself online is horrendous. He looks way better like this than he does on that picture, to be fair. I, I appreciate the work that you do. Um, I appreciate the, your journalistic integrity. And I know that Agostino Hinchcliffe strikes again. <laughs> that you're going to tell a fair story. Cast is sort of the dream of... of the vision of independence you know free speech man he's waffling this is like some startup shit man just get to the point that they'll be telling you about we're trying to democratize um uh, what you call it we're trying to democratize fucking dishwashers we're gonna be the fucking the uber of kettles bro just get to the fucking point man come on not bound by sort of corporate norms um the ability and the backbone backbone to support visionary talented unique visionary. independent voice yo fam relax man this is not the civil rights movement visionary independent voices they're not independent if they're assigned to you no aren't you like a major label you can't be you can't be spending anyway whatever let's just there's people like theo vaughn um you know cast perspective was independence is the product there were plenty of times where you know, we believed in a show. Uh, it ran into trouble. Maybe it was canceled in one way or another and canceled, quote unquote. And, and we stood by our creators, right? Can Lies. Lies. There's not, there's not a chance. Their whole entire business is propped up by ads or by advertisers paying them money, right? Paying them money because they feel that they have the best podcast or they have the best audience that they can maybe feed their products to and get some clicks or engagement or some self run and stuff that they make. If you have somebody on those shows who's cancelled or you've done something you know people don't like, you're going to be bad for business. So those ads are basically his boss. Those advertisers are his boss. So if they say no Brian Callen, no Chris D'Elia, they have to just say no Brian Callen, no Chris D'Elia. So him saying, oh, um, no, we stood by a crate. No, you didn't. I don't believe him. It's a lie. He, it, it sounds good to say because now it's kind of like, you know, it's all kind of, it's been brushed under the carpet. Brian Cannon's allowed to come back on a pod. Chris Lee is out there doing his thing. So it doesn't matter anymore. But let's be honest and say when it happened, it was obvious that the powers that be told them no. Do you remember when, um, 
They tried to do a fight in the kid behind the paywall. Do you remember that? It was like on Patreon. When Callum got accused of rape, there was a period where they tried to make it work and do like a podcast behind a, a paywall or behind Patreon. And then the advertiser said no. They stopped it straight away after one. And then I think they let they kept the Patreon up, of course, to grift and keep the money. And then I think the Patreon got changed to... I think the Patreon eventually ended up changing to either the Golden Hour or it got changed to um, Callan's thing, the Deep Waters. But when they when they cancelled that Patreon, if they cancelled it specifically because the advertisers were like, no, or or even Cars were like, no, I, I, we own the IP of like Fire and the Kid. You can't have another one behind a paywall. And also, this is going to look bad on the company anyway. So they for sure stepped in there. I just don't believe this whole thing about standing by creators. It makes no sense when you're literal customers are advertisers how are you going to stand by them if they tell you they tell you to jump you jump continue to support them through that time you know when maybe a more corporate organization wouldn't we we weathered the storm together um we believe truly that that's what you know was unique and special about cast and my heart and soul is still in that vision i'm a musician originally oh <laughs> i'm not gonna lie that's a red flag a failed musician who starts up a podcast network. Advertising. I don't know, man. That's a big red flag, bro. That's like saying if I'm a DJ and I start up an investment fund, <laughs> don't invest in it. You're going to lose your money. I'm going to run away to fucking the Seychelles or the Dominican Republic and I'm going to be over there chilling. Do not invest in my fucking startup or my investment fund if I tell you I'm a fucking a DJ that's failed and I'm starting up this fucking new microwave business. Like, don't do it. A musician. This is, this is always doomed. Um, and I got into this because I wanted to support shows that were... But also, not to be that guy, he's rubbing his mouth too much. I know I shouldn't be reading into all this fucking um, telltale signs, people, like, whatever. But he's rubbing his mouth too much. He looks like he's lying. No? Just four minutes in, there's too much mouth rubbing. There's too much this. Like, this is pure lies. Fucking the trend, going against the grain, but unique and important to the broader dialogue. Um, but where's the, where's the four million? I mean, I mean, yeah, exactly. I hear you. I hear you. Every, everybody's got a grand vision, but the grand vision, yeah. when it, you know, when we get to this point, everyone wants to know where the money is, not what the vision is. Sure. You know, we built an infrastructure, a cast that. <laughs> I love it. Where's the four million? We built an infrastructure, a cast. You know, what it reminds me of like when you do your English test in school, um, you have to write a particular, you know, whatever answer your question in English test and if you don't know the answer you just repeat the question in your answer just to give you some time or to fill up the, the, the page <laughs> that's what he's doing where's the four million um how cast media operates where's the four million in the world of podcasting <laughs> where's the four million we live in a world where <laughs> where's the four million black lives matter <laughs> he's like what <laughs> I wasn't am tremendously proud of. I believe that over the years we generated better revenue for creators. <laughs> Yo, the fucking the hand movements are just there's such a he's he's lying. I like that conversation. Look at that face. Press that's a press X for face doubt, isn't it? If ever there was a face that looked like press X for doubt, there it is. <laughs> um, paid them out more than other podcasts would necessarily be able to because we invested heavily in an infrastructure, took an individualized approach anecdotally um you know we but you're saying we, you pay out more but i i mean i mean clearly that's you know kind of not true right oh, wait wait but you you asked for my story do you mind if i i just just tell just tell the story you know <laughs> we're, we're getting to the financial <laughs> now he's getting touchy now he's getting touchy yeah now he's getting touchy look at the veins don't trust people who have veins like this in their neck for truth like this Special difficulties season. sure Sure. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> our vision, it really worked. Creators benefited, made, made a lot m more money than, than they would have. Um, uh, and so many creators are, you know, do have more money in their pocket now because of that. However, during the period from Feb <laughs> People said they got scammed. He said they got more money than ever would. To be fair, he's not wrong. He's not wrong. By the sounds of it, cast media in all these places... They were overpaying podcasts, it sounds like. Let's be fair to him. They were overpaying podcasts in the hope of signing them all up to their network 
in order to sell it. That's what it feels like to me. I'm not sure if I'm wrong here because I've worked for companies like this before, startups where if the business is horrible, it's horrible working atmosphere, but you can tell the, the founder only set this thing up so they can sell it down the line to a bigger company who might want to use the technology or the processes or maybe the talent to do some some other things, you know? That's probably what it feels like. So I feel like Cast Media overpaid on purpose to get all the big dogs on their fucking network and then to then use their names to then prop themselves up and then to later on sell. I think that was, that was the hope. So if they wouldn't have gone bankrupt, he probably would have tried to IPO Cast Media itself. But because it was about to go bankrupt, he was able to get a deal with Podcast One. They absorb them, take their network and go from there. So I think that's what basically happened. So... And I've seen it before. I've worked in startups where, you know, I've done sales and they literally tell you to like overpay on clients because you just want to get them on board. And I've done it before. You know what I mean? It's just, it's a horrible business, but hey. February, 2022 until February, 2023, our unit economics changed drastically. Our revenue per download, which is an important metric for analyzing sales performance, you know, free from content performance considerations, dropped by 58%. Um, in other words, over the course of those 12 months, the revenue that we could generate on one download uh, moved down by 58%, you know? Oh. So that is a that is a perfect representation, if you're saying the truth, that the podcast bubble has burst. We can see it. Because let's say Podcast One or Cast Media came about at the start when things were good. It was boom time, right? The rat pack of running around. Everything was fucking amazing. Money flowing, listeners all listening and shit. It's fucking amazing. Um, but then something changed. Something happened in people's listening habits and it all kind of fell off the wayside. I think mostly it's to do with the quality of the shows, personally. Sorry, I think it's the quality of the shows. I think the shows aren't good for what they are. Maybe they're over, they're over political, who knows? But for sure... The other the other factor about it people don't understand is this. I feel like is this. I feel like the business is a bit corrupt anyway. The metrics how they how they measure what's successful and what not successful. And I think most likely the advertisers recognized they weren't getting a return on their investments. They were they weren't seeing anyone clicking on their unique URLs, using their promo codes, and they're paying through the nose to advertise on these podcasts, but they're not really getting much return on it. And obviously with the financial downturn and COVID and shit, stuff got cut. And having worked in marketing, one of the first things that goes when you when a, when a, when a company's struggling is marketing spend. That's the first thing that goes after, probably after like staff cut downs and stuff. But marketing spend is usually the first thing that goes. You cut marketing spend in half sometimes to kind of get it down. So I think that's what happened. And they started to, some people started to record, look at the numbers and be like, hold on, we're only really getting... Because for sure, I think, you know, if you're a fucking Dollar Shave Club, I'd imagine 90% of your referrals are coming from probably like five to 10 podcasts of the big ones that exist out there. You can name them. And the rest of them are just like, you know, it's just like a branding thing. So if you're in a downturn and you want to really save money or you want to kind of be effective, you just cut the 90% off. So I think that's what happened. And then now we're seeing the true value of these podcasts because I think before it was inflated, it was a little bit um, bloated, but now we're seeing the real value of these podcasts and we're now seeing most of them aren't really worth shit. Okay, that took three minutes to get to a real answer. And I've got to be honest, this whole conversation was about that painful. Talking to somebody who owes creators millions and he's telling you how he got them paid so much money is a little frustrating. Um, one second, oversaturated, composition is a midget, Drogon was juicing over a comedy career. If for unfunny hacks left, right, center, times are good. Exactly, um, Ricky Bobby, just in case, oversaturated, composition is too, is the height of Rogan. He must be four for 11. Yeah, probably. Too many podcasts, it's all Rogan's fault. Uh, Fashion Roadman said it's not just COVID where everyone was tuning in, people are back to work now. Yeah, I I'm not too sure if I buy that Fashion Roadman. I'm not too sure. I think there's some, maybe maybe two things can be right. Because before COVID, people listen to podcasts. We were all listening to them before COVID. We were all having fun. I think some of my funnest, some of my most memorable podcast listening time was before COVID. Maybe before between like 2013 to 2018. That's like one of the boom times of, of fucking podcasting, right? We were all listen to them. Then COVID comes around and that should be the perfect time to sit down and listen to a podcast. Cool, listen to it. Then now all of a sudden, no one's listening to them. So I think... Maybe two things are right. Maybe the shows, there's, as um, Austin Casey says, it's oversaturated. There's too many. Um, and I think the shows aren't good. 
the shows just aren't good. Like, think about it. They're not that good, really. They're, it's just the same. Like, everybody's just sitting down talking. And for the most part, the comedians always talk to the same people. Um, they talk about the same things. They're not really interesting. They're not really funny. Like, they're not even trying to be funny. They're just trying to be serious. But you, you listen to comedians to be funny. They're not really being that introspective. Um, they're very disconnected to you and I, right? They don't really live the lives that you regular people live. So it's kind of a bit unsettling to listen to these people like complain about things that don't really like what? Like Q, a Q and airport, bro. Like whatever, right? So all those things I think are adding to it. But I genuinely, genuinely, genuinely think that it's no coincidence <laughs> that the shows just aren't good. I think we all kind of saw, we just kind of recognized they're just not that good anymore. And this is me coming from a Rogan fan. I've loved Rogan from maybe I started listening to I think from episode number four hundred around that kind of mark. So I've been an OG fan, and it's just you know you listen to it sometimes, but it's just it gets annoying. I I get annoyed listening to my own voice or speaking in general. I can't imagine what it must be like for people who don't do this and just want to listen. To, like it just it must be exhausting after a while. Like, okay, enough is enough. I don't want to listen to this anymore. So anyway, who knows? But setting that aside. The central claim of Colin is that all of this happened because revenues dropped. Also, his name is Colm. Former musician, name is Colm, bleaches his hair at 40. Something's telling me he's got, he's got like a Fender. Or what, what, what's that? Is, that? is it a Gibson? What's a brand of guitars? He's got like a Gibson on his wall, a guitar. Something tells me in his corner office of Cast Media, he had a fucking a guitar hung up on his wall. He had a drum set in the corner or something, right? He was the kind of guy when he's making his coffee and the thing, he's like singing, I'm for, take me back to Georgia. You know? Yeah, Fender, that's it. He's one of those guys that he'll be singing a song, right? In the fucking coffee room. And you have to pretend you're liking it. Like, oh, Colm, you got a really good voice. You know? There's something about him that's just... In 2022, and he just couldn't pay people on time. But as I spoke to people about Colin, I realized late payments weren't a new thing at all. People told me... That was always the case. Okay, you joined them in 2018. 2018. Yeah. So when did you start getting late payments? Basically, like they didn't come when they said they were going to come. And when did you stop getting full that payments? Right away. I, I answered that right away. That was right before, from the first check we were supposed Jesus to get. Jesus Christ. It didn't arrive when he said. It was never on time. Be a, so like, yeah, it, it, yeah, was, yeah. it wasn't unusual if it was like a month late, a month and a half wow. late. And then when it goes from, all right, a month late to two months late to three months late. And then I would say, hey, where's this, uh, where's the deposit at? I'd go, yep, they're, they're trying to figure out, man. He says it's, you're, he has this whatever investment coming. You're going to get this huge lump sum of money. So now it makes more sense why they do so many shows. Now it makes sense. See, this is this is this has always been my problem, really, with these guys in general, right? Like, why are you talking like an authority? Like, they actually think they're entrepreneurs because they have podcasts and they sell merch. They think they're entrepreneurs. They think they're businessmen. They'll hear a story on on. They'll comment on a story, and they'll be like talking about it so hard, aggressively, like they're knowledgeable on the topic, speaking about it like they own businesses and shit, bro. You don't even have a handle on this easy business. You're working with somebody who's meant to be essentially your 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 their their yeah you're a client of theirs. They have to do the best job for you. They need to impress you, and they are four months late with the payment, and that's normal for you. You're not you're not ringing the alarm bells. You're not firing them instantly. You see the difference with this kind of like boomer energy. Logan Paul is from an era or he's from a, a generation of kids who are like on it more with business, who know what they're doing, right? Even though he scams people still. The moment Cast Media did one thing wrong with the audio of his podcast, he fired him immediately. He's like, nah, I can't have you having this. I need my podcast, you know, to come out at this time. It needs to be at this level or whatever. One late payment, it was done. Because there's, because you're, you're fucking, you're Logan Paul. There should be a queue of people outside waiting to do business with you. Same with these guys. They, you're the client you're the prize like as academics will say why are you putting up with a company paying you four months late i'll tell you why they're putting up with it because they all know deep down that these guys are giving them inflated fees that's the that's the thing that i realized this is why it's a scam that's why they had everybody by the nuts so imagine you get paid net 90 days right three months you get your payment so in three months, you accrue, you accrue three months worth of paychecks. 
and they're giving you rates higher than the industry minimum or whatever, right? The industry standard. And it comes in your account just once. That'll be enough to hold you. They know they've already got you instantly because you're never ever going to get that kind of money from anywhere else. So you get 400,000 in your account, 300,000, 100,000. Like, oh my God. They've instantly got you forever. And now they can afford to keep paying you late because you know when it does come, when it does hit, it's a big payment. This explains everything about it. When really and truly what they should have done was being like, you know what, I'd much rather, because it, if it's me, I'd much rather get paid less and have it be consistent and on time than get paid more and have to chase it. Because I've done it before. Especially if you work, if, um, what you call it? Fashion Roadmap would know this. And everybody else, that's, 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 um, that's uh, what you call it, um, that works freelance. Invoicing is one of the most soul-crushing things to do. It legitimately will make you want to like think of some egregious crimes you want to commit on humanity, having to invoice people. It's horrible. Chasing payments and shit. It's really horrible. But sometimes you have clients that you work with who just pay on time and the experience is great. And you're like, you know what? I'd much rather take you who didn't pay me a lot of money, but you were pledged to deal with and it came on time than having somebody pay me an exorbitant amount, which I know I don't really deserve. And then it's always late. Because we know, because the thing was, oh, as, as humans, we know, we know what we're worth. Deep down, you know, we like, you know, you're not that delusional. Some of us aren't super delusional. You can be confident in your abilities and stuff, but you know what you're worth. You sometimes, you know, like I've worked in jobs before where I've known, you know what? I'm kind of getting overpaid here, but you just keep, you keep rinsing that fucking bad, you know, you just keep rinsing that fucking bad boy. And I think these guys realized they were getting overpaid, but they were too scared to go somewhere else because they knew they wouldn't get the same money they were getting, which then made them prime, prime people to scam. But to be fair, Brendan does have double digit IQ and Brian Callan goes on holiday when they're discussing these deals, right? Brian Callan goes on holiday to Greece when they're missing out on millions and Brendan is legitimately redacted. So, you know, he didn't have to work too hard to scam these guys. So then that's then come, then you're looking at, you know, now you're looking at four months, like it was the money. Then you're looking at six months, like, okay, man, where the hell is our money? Yes, that's a huge problem. Of course, up till 2023, money had slowly started coming in, so people were letting it slide. But as these balances built up over time, eventually Brendan and Brian realized they were owed 400 grand on The Fighter and the Kid and upwards of 1.6 million across all their shows. Now remember, Brian is just informed about Fighter and the Kid. You have to manage Thick Boy, Golden Hour, the other shows that are owed money. So Brian's like, can you believe this? I'm like, <laughs> yeah, that 400 grand is terrible. Try 1.6 mil. Bro. I'm the biggest victim. I love how Brendan has to be the, the biggest in everything, right? He has to be the best dad, the best athlete, the best football player, the best comedian, the best, you know, um, whiskey uh, manufacturer. He has to be the best. And in this issue, he somehow wants to take credit for being, having had the most money owed to him number one i don't believe this number because the guy just lies so my my natural instinct is to say what do you have you, you're not worth two, you're not worth 1.6 million i don't think he's worth 1.6 million none of his businesses are worth 1.6 million none even in even in, in combined so to say that you you're owed that much money in advertising i don't believe you but if i did believe you i would say this is the perfect indication or representation of how much they were overpaid. So it seems like cast media strategy was to overpay to get clients on board and to keep them on board, but it wasn't really reflective of what their value was. That's my theory. So maybe these advertisers weren't really paying that much. They weren't really paying super well, but I guess what he was trying to hope to do, he wanted to like, so imagine you overpaid the early talent, to attract new talent and then the new talent props up isn't that a ponzi scheme <laughs> isn't that a ponzi scheme i swear to god that's a ponzi scheme isn't that isn't that technically what that is that's a fucking pyramid scheme. that is it i'm figuring this out in real time and i'm a fucking redact right i'm a fucking imbecile i'm a fucking imbecile and i'm figuring this out in real time how could these guys not know this with all the background information, 300 pages full of fucking research, CAA, they're, they're represented by CAA and nobody, nobody, nobody. By the way, by the way, um, 
you see this is this is at the heart of it this is at the heart of it fashion roadman and everybody else in the chat says the same thing if if i didn't get my invoice payment in six months i'd be homeless and that's unacceptable exactly this is you see like this stuff right it just reveals more things and it just makes you kind of depressed a little bit like fuck man like this content game is like it's kind of like the, it's like it's kind of like the arts world isn't it and why do i say that they always say in, in entertainment and arts or arts and entertainment that really like most of the people that are you know at the top come from like rich families um connected families or just families that can afford them the opportunity to kind of you know try to make it as an actor as a musician as a dj or whatever and the reason why they say that is because a large part of those areas, you have to work for free before you get somewhere. And the only people that can really afford to work for free are people that have money, right? So what this represents, right, is that these guys are kind of wealthy. They don't act like it, but they are. Because no, none, I know I couldn't survive off of not getting paid for two months, let alone six. So imagine how much money these guys must have. That's what basically allows them the ability to do all this shit. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's the fucking issue about it. Or, or that, and that also, for me, is maybe why some of these guys don't connect with regular people as much, you know? Like, there's a lot of disconnect there. They really are in the 5%, you know, in terms of the earners, um, especially considering what they do, because they are grossly overpaid. That's one thing we noticed it too. These guys are not worth the money they were getting paid in any way, shape, or form. Um, and we're now, you know, obviously it's evidence with the views and whatever it may be and where people's attention is going. But it is kind of depressing to see that, you know what, actually to make it in this little content game and shit, you obviously have to have the resources to do it, the time to do it. But all of that time grinding, doing it for free, who else can do that? Or who else can afford to not get paid for six months? 1.6 million just oh yeah it's just there right wow 1.6 million what are we doing here hi luke and bc how do you guys feel about sean o'malley on the main card of ufc 269 fighting another unranked opponent while well, we have two ranked fights on the prelims two ranked fighters i think with one of the fights being dom cruz there might be another one as well what do you think yeah look there was once a successful uh cable tv comedian who said what are we doing here, Luke? And I think right now we're asking ourselves, what's the end game here? Is the end game for Sean O'Malley to run his contract out? Now, I should be clear, Colin denies that there are these payment issues before 2022. Your talent says they stopped getting paid as early as 2021, and they had issues and delays well before 2022. No, I'm not I'm not aware of any difficulties um, before you of know the end of 2022, of the beginning of 2023. Aware. Then I talked to his business partner and everything changed. He told me accounting was always a nightmare. My name is Dustin Knaus. Uh, I was Colin's business partner, as he would introduce me, and uh, VP of production and creative development with Cast Media. One of the things Colin said is he was not aware of any accounting issues, you know, early on. Um, is that true? Did you guys hear from talent about, because I, I, every talent I talked to said they were constantly complaining about accounting. Yeah, I mean, I like ev everyone from uh, from the beginning had, had complained about how long it took to get paid. Um, the managers would constantly step in. I think all of his accounting was done through Google Sheets, basically, and it was just him. But he would... Yeah, I've worked for these startups before. I've worked for a startup that had the entire fucking business on a fucking uh on a spreadsheet essentially right that was shared that everyone had access to absolutely crazy levels of bullshit mate like bloody hell Would never let me this is also why i don't have imposter syndrome this is why i can never doubt my own ability this is why i don't believe anything is impossible outside laws of physics because you'll work with people who are legitimately redacted but they are able to like have a business. They're able to have employees and shit. They're able to put a product out there to market. They're able to publish a movie, get a script written or whatever, put a movie. I mean, if all those things that any people are redacted, if they can do it, you can do it. You see everything. He wouldn't actually let me see what was coming in and what was going out. Um, and I was like, well, you know, I kind of need to get a whole picture and he wouldn't, he just wouldn't share it. Oh, that is a red flag. Mm. And it also lines up exactly with what I heard from a lot of the creators. 
The accounting was always weird. People had to chase it down, and the numbers were a little screwy. It led them to distrust what they were getting from Colin. I can tell you us personally, what we estimate we are owed is what they told us they owed us, plus whatever we think they still kept billing for after that date. Plus, we don't know truly what the accounting is because they stopped supplying accounting. And at one point earlier in the year, their accountant sent me two different sets of numbers of what money I was supposed to get. So I don't trust their accounting. I can't emphasize enough. I heard this complaint over and over, not just from Brian Last. Everyone was worried about the accounting, but a lot of people who spoke up were just anonymous because they were afraid of Colin suing them, which isn't surprising because Colin warned Brian, who started talking, quote, the ensuing damages, if you were to cause this deal to unravel, are within the region of 10 million to 20 million dollars. Consider this a serious caution. It would lead to decisive legal. <laughs> oh, I swear to God, if you owe me money and you try and threaten me like this, <laughs> I'm turning up to your kid's school. I swear to God, I'm turning up to your kid's school. You owe me money and you try and threaten me like this. I'm turning up to your child's school, bruv. I swear on my life, I'm turning up to your kid's school. I'm turning up to the reception. I'm saying, hey, I'm, I'm his uncle. I'm here to drop him home. And then it starts to get dark. Like, don't don't play with me. Don't write me an email. I consider this a serious caution. Are you are you having a laugh? Hey, Bre Brian, you know, don't hate me. Don't fucking hate me. Do you, do you like your legs? Do you enjoy walking? Okay. Cool. Fucking hey. Let's consider this a serious caution. How dare you, bruv? How dare you? Honestly. Action. So basically, he was threatening people and people are scared. But I realized... Imagine being scared of a guy that hangs a guitar on his wall. He's probably... You know you know, you know who he reminds you of? I bet he's one of the startup founders who walks into the that office... These payment issues. With his, I... with his bike and his little bicycle shoes clicky clacking. I mean, he's one of those kind of founders, like trying to make you feel bad because he he decides to cycle to work ten miles. Congratulations, you're you're gonna win the fucking Tour de France. Good good luck, right? He's that kind of guy. Clack 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 clack. He never drinks the beers. He's always make sure I'm not gonna drink today. I'm not gonna eat the pizzas. Yo, big up a uh, chocolate drop. You think Coffeezilla found the subreddit in his research when he said, "What are we doing here?" Dude does through work. Yeah, I loves. Um, do I think he no? Um, he's always been a fan of the Finding the Kids subreddit. I think he's always been. He's a lurker. He knows a bit about. He knows more about it than he's letting on. But he also didn't want to make this a, uh, you know, a bashing of the Finding the Kid. But you could tell he's he knows he knows about these guys. But I, I like that he approached it from a neutral point of view. He didn't try and go into it with any too many chauvinisms or too much. You know, he he didn't he didn't go in there too hard. But I think he knows. He definitely knows. <laughs> Big up you, um, chocolate dropper. I appreciate you, brother accounting issues. They were all clues, sure, but not the whole story. To really understand how it could be that cast fell apart, we need another piece of the puzzle, which is minimum guarantees. Remember I told you earlier that I was simplifying podcast networks. So let's go into the deeper waters. The truth is these deals vary wildly, and some of the bigger podcasters demand something called a minimum guarantee, where they aren't just paid a split of ads, they're paid a guaranteed minimum every month. And podcasters love this because it means they don't have to wait so long to get paid. According to Colin though, this is how he fell behind. We had months in there where our gross profit margins were, you know, literally negative prior to any operating expenses. Um, because the minimum guarantees that made economic sense when we made the deal were just completely underwater. Basically, he overpaid. Cast made deals to bring people on in the first place, overpromised, and then couldn't pay. Mm -hmm. Even Colin's former business partner agreed with this, although he thinks some of the money went to Colin personally as well. We've got... That's the shadiest part of it for me, because I think I've worked for businesses where they overpay for talent to get them on board in the hopes that you make it back through sales because you're hoping the talent that you get on board can market what you're doing, can sell it by just their name alone. Then you realize it doesn't work like that. You still have to sell. You still have to sell, sorry. They're a very small 
amount of people in the world who just their name alone can sell things. They don't really, there's not many of them, which is why they get paid the big bucks, right? They get paid the money because these guys can actually get people to buy shit, right? Um, but there's not many of them. So you still have to sell. Your sales team still have to work. But what this sounds like to me, he was pocketing a lot of that money. And I think Jim Cornette said before he made his Instagram private, he's got pictures of himself going all these exotic locations around the world. Maybe it's to do with his paycheck, but he definitely was pocketing a lot of the money. Because if if this was just a, a fact of him not overpaying, this would have just died over time. It would have just been a natural kind of bankruptcy thing over time because you're running out of money. You cut all the staff. You've kind of, you know, you streamline the business as much as possible. You just can't make the bills. But the fact that people are, you know, talking about money missing there, someone's late here. Like, it looks like a little bit of like, him putting some money in his pocket type of shit. So this is he seems like a scammer to be fair. Colin's narrative as his business partner, you look at the situation, four million missing. The big question on everyone's mind, where did the money go? Uh well I mean I think there's um, Amiri, um Seychelles, Corsica, Teslas, expensive coffee machines, fancy bike, a Porsche, maybe a G Wagon, wife stuff designer stuff carbone mr nice guys you know all these nice restaurants horses la all these type places that's probably where it went <laughs> cocaine addies yeah custom built house exactly landscaping that's very really expensive pools a good pool is gonna cost you a lot nanny maid what else could money go to uh <laughs> oh the hair because for sure, his hair looks horrible, but you know he's paying like $200. You know, he's one of those kind of guys that pays like $400 for fucking a haircut and he's fucking coloring and shit. So he's paying a lot for that. Yeah. There's like a couple places that the money has gone. Um, one is he built a custom house. And um, he was known for going on big, crazy vacations uh, in... You know, he went to Hawaii multiple times in 2022 Jesus and was posting Christ. about it on his social media. Um, there's not, <laughs> there's not a question of was there money in, in that sense uh, to be able to buy land and where a lot of celebrities go to to escape. But aside from that, the other thing that he has done is essentially make constant minimum guarantees to new talent to try to entice them to join cast media so say you know i'll give you a one-year guaranteed two hundred fifty thousand dollars five hundred thousand dollars whatever Christ. his minimum guarantee is now i've heard that even um as soon as february of this year he was offering multi-million dollar minimum guarantees now we know why brendan has so many podcasts now we know why his his brain was like, hold on, if I'm getting half a million on one, how if I do four? <laughs> right? That's what, that's what he thought straight away. I get half a million on one. If I get four, <laughs> you know, that's why he has so many pods. Oh, this explains so much, man. Honestly, this is why not to I'm not sucking myself off here, but this is why I think, forget me. Think of the smaller creators, you know, the, the fashion roadmans in here, the talking thrones who comes on the stream sometimes. That's why you support the smaller create the smaller content creators out there who are just like doing this shit mostly because it's just fun. Yes, you might get some beer money here and there during a the month, but it's nothing to fucking live on, especially not in fucking London, right? But that's why you have to really, really support the smaller creators because usually most of us out here are doing this because for shits and giggles because i'll be watching this anyway on my own and i'll be talking about it on the on the forums but why not do it with you guys live on here it's quite fun to do but these guys legitimately saw podcasting like a hustle it was like a fucking it was it was a new hustle basically right the new little thing that came in the advertising money was good and it just kept pushing out the pods not caring about the quality of the show brendan has four shows that are all the same essentially just guys sitting around talking about current topics nothing's different about the shows it doesn't create anything fun it's not a fun experience it's not even f good to look at not fun to it's not entertaining they don't do anything with it that's the interesting part about it they get all these big bucks but the the shows aren't really entertaining they're not really great um exactly coiler don't doesn't research mma ufc imagine back in the day i don't know if this works let's see if this works maybe there's a scenario where brendan before was getting paid a salary from Showtime 
to do below the belt. Plus, he was getting ad money. That explains so much from before. He was spending like crazy. New car here, new haircut, fancy shoes. He was getting podcast money plus a salary. Can you imagine how much was coming in at that time? And that's and that's at the peak of T5K when they're getting like half a million, um, you know, views on a video and shit without guests. Or back in the day when Chris Lear was on there, Theo Vaughan's first pop podcast on there, Will Sasso. And the show quality hasn't really improved. It's still the same old shit. So that's a really sad thing about this. Like, if you're going to get the money, I don't. I think for me, it should always go back into the work that you're making. It should always go back into trying to improve everything that you're doing a little bit. You know, you get some more money, you update the, ca- you, you upgrade your cameras, you maybe get a studio, um, you maybe start spending more time researching the topics you want to talk about before you go on stream, before you record stuff. Little improvements so that your fans and your viewers can see. Okay, cool. We keep supporting this guy. He's gonna keep making some changes. It's gonna be more entertaining, fun. We're gonna see this journey go on. But those guys were just, just putting out shit for the money, and you could tell. That's why the show's gone to crap. It says honestly, it's so revealing. And also, I'd imagine part of the reason why the shows went to crap because you know they don't obviously care about the shows they put out it just turn them out to make money but i wonder if a lot of it has to do with the fact that they weren't getting paid and it doesn't matter if you're rich or you're poor when you don't get paid your motivation to work basically decreases so i wonder if a lot of that lacking quality was that a lot of these guys were missing out money and they're like bummed out so it was kind of coming through on the shows maybe partly onto that who knows but fucking hell bro this explains so much so at, oh at the same time where he claims his revenues are way down he's yes. offering multi-million dollar yes. minimum guarantees for talent yes yeah so you know his priority is trying to keep the new talent happy for a while um with essentially his whole goal of selling cast to make big money in the end um but yeah, he. I would say that honestly, most of the money probably went to the minimum guarantees of other talent uh, instead of to the people that it was supposed to go to. Wow, that might be the closest thing we have to a coherent answer on what happened to cast media. Although you see, you see what I hate about these scammers. And I, again, I think it's a scamming thing. So I'm, I'm being dumb. I know when I say this, I'm going to sound dumb. But I hate that scammers don't even have one person they don't scam everyone gets scammed you know that's the thing about scammers they don't even have like a trusted group of people that they don't scam they scam everybody i guess it's like a thief right you're gonna steal from everyone but you would imagine if you're scamming right if it's me and i'm scamming in my logical brain in order to keep on scamming really well i'm gonna make sure my business partner is in is in on the scam like hey come 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 look look, look. here's what i'm doing right i'm taking the money off the top and i'm giving myself a little bit I'm going to bring him in so I've got someone that's that's complicit in my crime. But also I want to make sure that I'm protected so we, we both got, you know, something in this. But no, you're scamming your clients and you're scamming your business partners. <laughs> Everyone gets scammed. Probably you're scamming your employees. I bet you the people that worked at Cast Media probably don't get paid, don't get paid on time. He's not paying the fucking cus- the clients who are meant to be the persons you're looking after the most. He's not he's not paying his fucking, you know, colleagues, people on the same level, the co founder like fucking hell, man. Our story doesn't stop there because obviously that's a pretty big accusation. So- <laughs> Timothy Oblivion, exactly. See looks this is a disconnect with the podcast people. I can't go a single day without getting paid or my whole house of cards collapses. Exactly. The regular person couldn't even survive a week without their pay. If, if they get paid weekly, I need that money at the end of the week. If I don't have that money, that is World War III. I'm catching a case, but we need to get that money. These guys went six months, maybe longer before. No, they went four months without even noticing they didn't get paid. Then they figured it out in month six. Keep that in mind, by the way. Figured it out in six months. They did, what was going on? Oh, there's something off here. My alarm bells would have been ringing from minute one. From month one, when they got paid late, you got one more chance. Two strikes only. You pay me late again, we're out. Especially if I'm these guys. I'm famous. I'm well known. I'm Joe Rogan's friend. In Brendan's case, I'm Joe Rogan's fucking cock holster. You know what I mean? I am going to go out there and get another deal. If you can't get another deal, then that shows that you're not businessmen, you know, not you're not the businessman you think you are. Hire somebody else out there to go get it for you or just do it yourself. But I'm not gonna wait for you to do pay me late three times in a row when I'm the fucking prize, when I'm the talent, I'm the celebrity, I'm the, you know, whatever. 
it doesn't make any sense. Some of the money may have gone to a house. So I decided to look into that and found that Colin Thompson indeed bought a $1.7 million house the same year as his financial troubles. And I also found out that right about the time he was talking about declaring bankruptcy, he moved that house into a trust where the trustee was a Wyoming LLC he set up. The previous company I worked at, not the one I'm at now, but the previous company I worked at unfortunately went bankrupt, right? But the way it went bankrupt and how it was dealt was perfect. Unfortunately, the business just didn't work out. It was meant to get some sort of investment. It didn't come through. Cool. But you know what happened? You could see the founder was doing everything in his ability to get that deal on, to not have to fire everybody and not have to fucking, you know, uh, close down the business. He was staying late. He was looking very disheveled. He had bags under his eyes. He was the first in, the last out. Um, towards the end, we heard he had a part-time job he didn't tell anyone about. He went to keep that kind of to himself, to make some money on the side, to make payroll. Like this stuff that he was doing, he was selling his, he was selling his, no, I think remortgaging his house. All this stuff that he was doing, right? Is a complete contrast to your, your, your company's going bankrupt and your boss is going on holiday. They're, they're making a custom built, um, they're designing a custom built house. They're buying new clothes. They're going on these fancy trips. Like you see the contrast in optics and shit. Maybe again, maybe my old boss was doing it to kind of look like a certain way. I don't know. That just shows like how much of a piece of shit you are. You know, people are suffering in your company. People don't get their paychecks on time. You always get paid on time. And then here you are just flaunting your cash everywhere. Which from where I stood looked a lot like hiding assets from a bankruptcy right before a bankruptcy. But when I confronted Colin about this, he said I had things completely backwards. The truth is he was hiding his property for a totally different reason, a very sympathetic reason. We anonymized our address because we were getting threats um, in, the, in the last 30 days. There was, sure. there's been, you know, sure. there's been I nothing think, I think you can see, yeah, I think you can see though how other people might see it another way where it looks like you're trying to shield it by hiding it exactly. from a personal name into a trust owned by an LLC. I mean, I'm just I, in a very favorable well, state. I assume you I'm listen just, to the I'm Jim just, Cornette episodes where I'm they just specify where I live, right? I, I assume you listen to the Jim Cornette episodes where they specifically call out where I live. We were really, really concerned. Such a, the, I, there's nothing more that I hate about weasel guys like this, right? People don't play about their money. No one does. Maybe everyone's got varying levels of annoyance when it comes to it, but most people don't play about the money, especially regular people who are just working to pay the bills and keep the lights on. What do you think they're going to do when they don't get their money? How do you think they're going to speak about you? It's not going to be favorable. And he's just crying. They put my address out there because you haven't paid them, brother. You're ignoring their emails. You're, you're ghosting them. You're leaving them on red. You're not replying back. You're not giving them a timeline of when they're fucking going to get their money. And if people are just going to sit there and wait for you to figure it out, people are going to get angry. They're going to say some, some mean things about you. They might threaten you. They might actually follow through with the threats. What do you expect? You say, people were, people were actually put my, I, mean, I assume that you listen to the Jim Cornette. But it's like, brother, man, come on. But this is what scammers are like, isn't it? They're, they're you know, out front, you know, you're kind of sneaky with a the scamming. Then when people kind of confront you, you start to act like a victim. Concerned. We were getting threats. When I heard this, I was pretty alarmed and I totally understood his fears. So I went to go ahead and look for the episode where Jim Cornette apparently specifically called out where he lived, but it wasn't there. <laughs> Actually, course. Jim Cornette never mentions a specific address, but a general area. But way more damning for Colin's story is the fact that that episode came out in July, but Colin formed his LLC for moving the house in June. Before these threats ever happened, he's nice. creating this shell company. So I found it very hard to believe. I pointed this out to Colin and he said this, quote, they revealed general details and I anticipated the possibility of this happening. Brian threatened it very specifically in my original email exchange with him back in May. So I got a hold of those emails. There was no threat in them. Instead, Brian said things like, consider this a serious caution. We are gonna make sure to endlessly let all listeners know with great detail that Colin Thompson of Podcast One stole our money because he doesn't know how to run a business, which is sort of true. This guy doesn't know how to run a business. So I became increasingly convinced, maybe, just maybe, Colin might be lying to me about why he hid his house in a trust with the Wyoming LLC trustee. Okay, I know this is a bit inside baseball right now, but it's important because I think it reveals intentions because I then looked up the website he used to create the LLC. 
And the website tagline for Collins uh, LLC is, quote, asset protection <laughs> is our only focus. So, you know, oh, want to hide your house? Wrong company. Calm. Not their focus. Asset Jesus protection? Does. That's Perfect. your guy. Exactly. I mean, I'm not surprised, but I'm surprised that he tried to say this wasn't the case. So I sent a screenshot of that to Colin saying, hey, you're obviously hiding assets in this company that specializes in asset protection, protection planning. planning yeah. Uh, where the other tagline, by the way, is creditors will be forced into a better settlement or to dismiss the case altogether. <laughs> and when I sent that to Colin, he responded, quote, I can't speak to what's written as marketing material on a website. I didn't write it. Come on, bro. We got you. OK, I can't go show up at an asset Focus protection only store and say, hey, I was just looking for a little anonymity. You know, that's not being honest. <laughs> And look, I don't know how dumb this guy thinks we are, but in my opinion, what happened is pretty simple. I think Colin bought a $1.7 million house the same year as he had trouble paying people. I think his accounting was always sketchy. I think he overpromised people money to attract new talent. And I think in the end, he tried to sell it all to a bigger company and force these podcasters into raw deals. And worst of all, this is not a new story. Colin is not unique. Actually, the main reason I took this case is because we've all seen this story play out before. Sleazy business guy screws over artist or musician or podcaster. Look, to be honest, I wanted to find out how it happened, but I also wanted to find out how we can learn to prevent it in the future. Because to be honest, I'm as much in this media landscape as these guys. And I think the answer starts with how you get involved. How did Colin find and sign all these celebs? Well, the truth is some people were introduced Theo Vaughn was introduced by Brendan Shop. Oh, that's tough. And that explains so fucking much. From just a viewer point of view, who doesn't know anything, who lives in their mum's basement, and who has fingers covered in Cheeto dust, this also might be part of the reason why Theo said, I don't want that. This might be part of the reason why Theo said, skedazzle. Don't you think it's... I don't believe in coincidences. I don't. I'm sorry. Theo steps away from Thick Boy and his career goes... <laughs> Why is that? Think about it. Think about it. The business was terrible. The business was terrible. He wasn't feeling inspired. He wasn't feeling motivated. Because if you remember, that was when Theo was at his worst. You remember? If you watch Theo's podcast, he was always talking about how depressed he was. He relapsed a couple of times. He had to go back into fucking, um, what you call it? Uh, he had to go, you know, whatever that, that thing, um, whatever that thing is called when you want to be sober. Like, do you remember? That was one of the p worst periods that Theo had around the pandemic time era. Around that type of time, he was questioning his whether well, he should be in comedy and should be a rehab. He was questioning whether he's doing comedy. Like he was going through a bad time, and then as soon as he steps away from Brendan, he's never looked better. He's never looked better. He's got the sparkle back in his eyes. He's making black people laugh now, right? Black people love fucking Theo. They've seen clips of him all over the place and shit. Like he's on every single podcast. Dana White is sucking his dick and wants him to get involved with the UFC. His numbers are crazy. Like the Jordan Peterson episode is on 2 million views for fuck's sake. Do you know what I mean? Like he's doing crazy, crazy well. It's no coincidence. The moment he stepped away from Brendan, everything went crazy. But I wonder if the reason why he stepped away from that was because of the cast media stuff because Brennan was so tied in with cast media and most likely went to stay with them because they were paying them over the industry standard or paying them way more than they're actually worth feels like nah I can't be around this bad energy and he just bounced I wonder if that's the reason but Brendan has a lot to answer for and you know what to add another layer to complexity to this allegedly that calm guy is an old friend of Brian Callens they're kind of the similar age group and from what I read on the fucking Find the Kids subreddit, allegedly that comb guy and Brian Callen, their both their dads are friends, allegedly business partners. They go back. <laughs> Rich people shit, you know? So I guess this comb guy was a failed musician. His daddy gave him some money to start a podcast network because he he didn't know how to, you know, do anything else. He signs a podcast, does what he needs to do, and obviously in the process scams people. But they don't mention that part of it. They don't mention that part of it. Um, <laughs> C yeah, exactly. CIA asset. Tinker Taylor podcast? But I asked Brian and Brendan how they got involved, and their answer struck me as part of the problem. 
But was he just offering better deals than everyone else? No, I no, no, no. It's, it's word of mouth. It's because what happens is they go, who is your age? Whenever, whenever he speaks like this, please, please, for, in the love of God, whenever Brian does this whole, he does a short straining and starts over enunciating, that's when you know he's lying and he's nervous and he's exactly defense like, like when he starts doing this shit, that's what you know. Because he knew what the he knew what this question was getting at, right? It was gonna make them look bad. So he goes, back in my day. Deals and everyone else. No, I understand. no, no, no. It's, it's word of mouth. It's because what happens is they go, Who is your agency? We we don't know the no nobody, nobody like we're not interacting with these people all the time. What happens we're is smart. like if there's an agency that we this person's research. with and this person's with we don't you know, look at we things. go that, 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 do you make money? Yeah. All right, can you hook me up? And then especially when comics are talking like man. So what they're basically trying to say is comics are dumb. When comics are talking, they're basically too dumb to do any sort of research. They're too dense. You know, they don't have the time. They're too busy, right, to be on stage doing all these amazing fucking forward thinking, um, inspirational, life changing fucking jokes on stage. They don't have the time to do a quick research, do a bit of Google, you know, check some fucking stuff on Trustpilot, maybe check some stuff on forums and shit. Nah, don't got time for that shit. And this guy is killing it for us, man. Yeah. I made. 1.6 million this year and like damn that's more than i made who you, you, you think you take me on then it becomes this like <laughs> snowball effect and you know and then everybody's there yeah that's what they talk about when they meet up by the way how can we extract more money out of this shitty podcast how can we make more money out of this sh out of this podcast where we just sit around talking about guys dicks all the time how can we make more how how can we extract more money from our fans not What's funny? Do you see this interesting thing? No, nothing about improving a show. How can we generate more fucking M's in our bank account? Not improve the show, nothing. Zero about that. Just make more fucking money. This is the issue. And look, it's not to absolve Colin. It's not to put any blame on anyone who got screwed over here. But the truth is, people are always led around with these dollar amounts. Oh, you made this much. You know, that's how they get you in these bad contracts. And then they don't pay you and you're left chasing a Wyoming LLC to nowhere. Exactly. So this isn't just about these podcasters. It's everywhere. It's about 360 deals in music, MCNs with YouTubers, and just honestly business people begging you to let them control your money and then you getting scraps. It's as disgusting as it is common. And I really hope that any aspiring people in media learn from these mistakes and scams and realize you don't need these middleman people most of the time. But more than that, do not trust people with your business who promise you the world. Mm -hmm. In fact, usually that's the worst red flag. Exactly. Oh, you're going to make all the money. Just sign here. It's a trap. And you never know what's in the fine print until you read it. Just ask Dylan Danis. Okay. So in my opinion, in my opinion, this whole, to wrap this whole thing up, and wasted that the end is right but i would disagree on one part i don't think it's fair to compare the plight of recording artists musicians especially who get who get themselves in bad 360 deals despite all the wealth of information that's out there um in order not to get in those deals then podcasters i think these podcaster guys should be laughed at you should we should all be pointing and laughing at these guys for getting themselves in such a predicament because most of these guys come from some level of wealth most of these guys already had a name already were somewhat famous. So with that name alone, with that clout, with that brand recognition, they can negotiate better deals for themselves. But they chose not to, primarily because they're lazy. I don't buy this excuse, oh, I'm a comedian, I should have to do my business deals. Brother, you're a celebrity in some way, shape or form. It's a very niche celebrity, but you are a celebrity. The deals are coming to you, most of them, 80% of them, I would say, fuck it, put that number out there. All you have to do is negotiate the terms, figure out what the fucking deliverables are, sign and get that done. It's not much work, but I don't blame the artist who then get put in the 360 deals or sign them because for the most part, most musicians, especially if it's, let's just say rap music, you're mostly coming from a very, very poverty stricken environment or background. You are literally trying to make it in music, which is really crazy anyway, to, because percentages and the amount of people that make it is really small. But most people that get into music, they're trying to do it in order to kind of drag their family out of poverty. You're trying to help to put food on the table, pay your rent, whatever it may be. You're trying to make it all, you know, at all costs because this is the only thing that you have. So I understand when a record executive says, you know what, here's a $100,000 advance, more money you've ever seen. Imagine 
you're a, a working class person, you're middle class person, you've, you've, you've never seen $100,000 in your bank account. Someone says here for music. And again, think about it this way. You've never got paid from a job 100000 The most you got paid for your art is $50 or a drinks token. And then suddenly somebody's giving you a, a 30 grand, 50 grand, plus they're telling you to sign on this dotted line and they're going to have you know a percentage of everything that you make from now on. You're going to look at that money and be like, you know what? I need this. I'm hungry. I'm starving. I need this and I want to make it. So I, I understand why you take it. Don't take it, but I understand why you take it. These guys, the Brian Callens, who has a dad who was a fucking financier and is super wealthy. Brendan Schaub, who comes from a comfortable background as well. All these guys have family with money. They have brand recognition from the stuff that they've done associated with Rogan. There's no excuse to do this. There's no excuse for you to be in this predicament. The only excuse for your own business predicament is obviously greed because you were drawn by the money that they were offering, which was way over the industry standard. And of course, for the most part, it's just pure and utter laziness and unwillingness to do the actual work. No level of curiosity, no level of intrigue, no level of trying to get involved in the business more. You want to purport and show that you're a big businessman and that you're a beast of a businessman because you sell some t-shirts and some shitty whiskey. But when it comes to actually sorting out deals on your own to get the deal over the line, you don't do it. And it shows. And that's what happens with someone who scams them. So as bad as I can feel for those kind of guys, I also feel that like they were the most easy marks in the world. Think how easy it is to scam Brendan and Brian Callum. One guy is legitimately a redact. The other guy goes on holiday, um, doesn't really read contracts, doesn't really pay attention, just looks at the money that comes in their account. They were the easiest marks in the world, the easiest marks in the world. But the really sad thing about this is that the podcast network thing he was working on, there was some good to it, you know? There was some good, good idea. Um, but clearly he was in it. From the beginning, he was in it just to fucking inflate what he was doing in order to sell it down the line but then he saw the money coming in and he started scamming that was the issue at hand because for me personally it's always gonna be a red flag when the advertisers that's because it'd be different right if cast media had like a model where they had like a range of advertisers and they paid each podcast based on their downloads a percentage of that overall pot they get you know but i would imagine a lot of brands or a lot of advertisers were maybe only advertising on certain pods or certain pods got so you know what i mean so it depends so basically what i'm saying i bet you any money the the numbers were always wrong and i bet you colm was lying i bet you some of the monies that he got from the advertisers was lower than what it was or it was higher than what it was but he never gave them accurate numbers i have a feeling that was also the case so the money that they were getting because think about this, like if you're if you're getting owed 1.6 million, think about how much money they're making. If they're making 1.6 million, think how much money they're making. So for sure, that money coming into his account, he saw that he, he, he couldn't resist the temptation to scam, and this is what's happening here. But I think one thing is for certain, in my humble opinion, I think what we've realized with this stuff is that most of these podcasters, or most of these podcasters, all of them, to be honest. They are grossly, grossly, grossly overpaid. Like, to the nth degree. To the nth degree. These guys are grossly overpaid. They, that, the money they're getting paid is just... For what they're doing is insane. Because people have to say that about the streamers, right? The XQCs and these kind of guys getting, you know, $100 million contracts and shit. Fair enough. Maybe you can say they're over, overpaid in some regards. But the money that these guys are getting too is on the same level, man. I think so um it wasn't didn't make any sense um anyway what are you guys saying here in the chat about this thing um clint gonna have to survive on potato clips <laughs> that's I do funny chin chin gonna be coming back to sing exactly he's gonna be singing Harry Styles soon my moose's papa said he didn't had he hadn't been paid by cast for six months so what the fuck was he still doing adverts for them exactly um, exactly Marty Moose 300 pages Stinger Goose says BGL never got getting his money is he nah but BGL's money not getting it is mostly a personal thing it's always been a personal thing um, he broke you know he betrayed Brendan's trust um, he exposed him to the world and shit he didn't like that so I think he, he just not giving the money just to kind of be a cunt but if he wanted to he could give it to him he's just not going to give it to him 
if if he, if he's forced to be, he will, but he doesn't want to. Um, that's what basically is happening. Um, the Reaper and uh, the rapper and the Redact podcast, Zachary Ochoa says, "You nailed it. The scams will happen on independent labels, small labels. It's kind of you to be ready for them as you come up. No one is there to hand you a lawyer." Exactly, Ochoa. Um, for Russian Redman says, "Still not over him saying you we don't know these people. <laughs> like, bro, how do you not know who controls your money?" That's a privilege of like that. That I think is a one thing that I um that I wish I could have had when I was younger. Like just that ability to like not have to worry about shit like that. Because I think forget privilege when you grow up with wealth and you have like money and you're able to go on nice holidays, right? Cool. When you grow up, you can always go on holidays, right? It's all not a big deal. You can always make up for the things that you missed out on when you're younger if you don't have money. Cool. I think that brain that you have when you grow up in that kind of level of wealth and comfortability where you know the bills are always looked after. There's never a time when you don't have butter in the house or something. It must be so nice, isn't it? To have that kind of brain where it's just like, nah, I don't know. I don't know who they are, but they seem cool. He's got blonde hair. He'll sort it out, you know? That almost, that ambivalence, that carefree, just like, that's going to be okay. That is going to be why I made the money, you know? That's something that you can't buy. That attitude, that kind of just like, because you meet them guys sometimes. When you go on holiday, you go out sometimes. You meet a guy and a girl who just, they just ooze this vibe of somebody that's never had to worry about that in their entire lives, ever. <laughs> They're having to worry about the, you know, the, the Wi-Fi getting cut off, your fucking phone getting disconnected, whether you have enough money for bread. Like, they don't have never worried about that. That must be like, that's the real privilege. Forget a Lamborghini and Louboutins. Just not having that in your brain. Not having to worry, okay, how can I split how can I split fucking $20 over fucking one week? N never a worry. Never a worry. These niggas are going to fucking Selfridges on Wednesdays. You know what I mean? Wednesday afternoons, they're going to Selfridges and walking out with 10 bags. You're like, fuck, you know, on a Wednesday. At the beginning of the month. I just paid my, I just paid my rent. <laughs> I got nothing left. <laughs> that, that, that day after when your rent gets paid. Oh, it's such a beautiful day, man. The day after, because I think my my limit of not paying my limit to pay my rent at first access, I think it's the fifth of the month. So sometimes I'll stretch it. And it's like, oh my god, your it, your number looks so good. Then the moment you fucking the moment that that money comes out of your account, it goes like, okay, this is who I really am. <laughs> anyway, um, popping up your name prior. Martin Moose says all these podcasts were getting minimum monthly payment from cast. It's a shady practice by cast, but Papa was in a scam and why exactly Martin Moose. Brilliant comment. All these podcasters were getting a minimum monthly payments from cast media. It was a shady practice by cast media, but Papa was in on the scam and this is why he started six podcasts to get with that minimum money. Exactly. And it showed because the, the, this is the thing. If you're going to try and hustle, make the work good this is a scam that they do it's like it's really um it's a it's a weird thing to be honest i i don't, I don't know if, if this makes sense to me but maybe i'm too too logical i think when it comes to content right your audience is basically your customer or kind of your boss so effectively if you keep them entertained and you provide them with a good show or with good content or with good engage or a good whatever you're just a good character you good make good whatever you do you would hope that they would repay you by watching your stuff. And when they watch your stuff, it increases your numbers, which would then help you to get more ads. So even if you're in it for the money, concentrating on the content actually makes you richer. If you think about it, it actually makes you richer in the long term. Even if you're only in it for the money, which, I sh which you shouldn't do. But if you're only in it for the fucking money, actually focusing on actually making a fun, entertaining show that your fans will like or your viewers will like is the way to go. But Brendan and those guys do the opposite. They make loads of podcasts and they're all fucking garbage. You know? And then what that ends up doing is that you're getting overpaid anyway by cast. Your show shit because you're not, pay, you're not putting any effort into it. You're not doing any research. Like Brendan is a former fucking UFC fighter and he's not even researching the cards beforehand. He doesn't even watch tape of like previous fights and shit to analyze the fighters and their styles and what would matter. He just reads it off of Wikipedia stuff like insane right you're not doing any any research whatsoever you're getting overpaid by that company when that company goes down and you'd have to go and find a new partner to do your ads for 
your numbers have, have been hurt because you're not doing a good show. So you're now going into those new offices with worse numbers than you did from the other place that you get overpaid by. So you're not going to get whatever you're going to get with a previous place. So you have to go get a shit deal. It's actually a backwards way to think about it. It doesn't even make any sense, which is, in my opinion, the worst way to do content or the worst way to do a podcast. Like you're literally like hurting yourself and you're also making your fans bored your viewers bored they're tuning out which is which i think is a really good indication because there, there are a lot of us out here myself included who are vocal about the things that we don't like right but i think most people don't care they just stop watching most people don't have time to go on reddit they don't have time to watch my videos they don't have time to watch uniques or to watch two days to try. they don't have time they don't give a fuck they just vote with their eyes and their attention and their ears and that's what you see on the videos on the fire and the kid look at all their views because the show shit and why is the show shit because they're only in it for the mula. 